Stories of the Science Podcast with your girl and with an everyone and welcome to another episode of the Roots of the Science podcast with your girl Anne with an E. My guest today is South African Richard Hay. He's finalizing his master's in agronomy at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. He attributes his interest in science, particularly agriculture, to his childhood where he grew up on his grandfather's farm who was a qualified plant breeder. Richard believes that there needs to be a change in the mindset that agriculture is not a serious or complex science. He believes that social media can be a tool to change the stigma. In this episode, we learn more about his master's research, where he looks at how small scale and emerging commercial farmers are using social media to connect with one another and share information, as well as how researchers at university institutions can use these platforms for effective science communication. Richard then goes on to explain that there is a massive need for these online platforms as the small-scale farmers are hungry for the information that is relevant to them, to them about the theory of agriculture science in order to upskill themselves. To find out more about this, do stay tuned. Hi, Richard. Hi, Anne. Ah, thank you for being on the show and for taking time to chat with me. I'm so excited to talk with you. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's my absolute oh. favorite thing in the world to talk about my research and agriculture <laughs> in general. Oh, fantastic. So this will be a goodie. Um, but before we get into that, just tell me a bit about yourself, like where you're from, your age, where you're based now, you know, just an intro. So I am South African. I am 24 years old. I am based in Pretoria uh, because I study at the University of Pretoria. But mm -hmm. I spent my early childhood in suburbia in a place called Benoni. And then when I was 10, I moved to my grandfather's macadamia farm outside Nelspreet. Okay. Um, so I spent most of my growing up in a, in a rural setting out on a farm. Okay, so we're going to get into that just now, but just as a little icebreaker and for people to know about you, um, like you said, you, you lived in Benoni, now Spreit, and now you're in Pretoria. Um, and I just want to know in this beautiful South Africa, what is your favorite place here? Uh, so my favorite place is the Low Felt, where Nelspreet is situated. Uh, I love the climate, it's subtropical, uh, and I'm really into nature. So I love the wildlife and the plant life out there. And then obviously my mom still lives there. So Oh, okay. Nice. Fantastic. Okay, well, um, Richard, can you just tell us a bit about um, your educational background in terms of what you're currently studying and also um, take us back to some of the influences that actually influenced you getting into your field of agriculture. I know it might hint along the, the like you said, where you grew up, but I just want you to just rewind a little bit and let's get to the roots of your science. So as I said, I'm at the University of Pretoria. I completed a BSc Agric in Applied Plants and Soil Sciences here at the end of 2017. Um, I'm mm. now finishing up my master's in agronomy as part of a water research commission study, which is looking at South African government's agri-parks initiative. And then I have signed on to continue and do a PhD as well. Um, I also did a, an online short course in science communication through Stellenbosch in Stellenbosch University in 2018, which I would highly recommend to anyone interested. It's a fantastic course. Mm. Uh, but my interest in science and specifically agriculture does stem from my childhood. So my grandfather, the one on whose farm I grew up on, was a plant breeder by profession before he retired to farming macadamias. Um, he actually also studied here at the University of Pretoria. Oh, okay. uh, and so because of him, I grew up around plants and I used to spend many hours listening to him explain his breeding projects and then pottering mm -hmm. around in his greenhouses and his fields. So that's where the agriculture comes in. Uh, but my parents also had quite a strong influence in developing my appreciation and sense of wonder for the natural world. Uh, and they provided me with an endless supply of books. 
uh, growing up, which was fantastic to be privileged to to have that opportunity. And so yeah. Yeah. that really molded the, my scientific approach to the world. And then I'm also really big on critical thinking and researching for myself as opposed to just asking or expecting answers from other people. So mm. that's sort of where the, the science comes from, I guess. Oh, fantastic. I'm glad to hear that. So um, you mentioned that um, as part of your educational background, you've also taken um, some courses in science communication at Stellenbosch. Um, yes. I'm assuming this kind of links with your current re- research uh, which looks at, for your master's, um, which looks at how small scale and emerging commercial farmers are using social media to connect with one another and share information. And also how as researchers and students in, academ- in academic institutions like the one you're at can use these platforms for effective science communication. So um, I just want you to tell me more about this topic um, because it's unique. Not many people are really, okay, well, I stand to be corrected, but this is the first time that I've heard um, somebody working specifically in this, but I think it's so relevant, especially in this day and age. And I think as we are in this climate of uh, the pandemic, we're seeing more and more why it's so important to have effective science communication. But um, also in agriculture, I think it's also important. So just tell me more about that. So I actually got into the social media research completely by accident. Um, Oh, okay. (laughs) So my master's originally started off looking at water or irrigation efficiency of small scale farmers. And that's Mm -hmm. kind of what the the project that my master's is part of still looks at. Uh, but my supervisor presents a course on sustainable crop production to second year agricultural students. Mm. He introduced this project, uh, which the students had to create a multimedia item explaining a sustainable agricultural concept to small scale farmers. And one of the groups okay. in the first year created a Facebook page as part of this project. And so he thought this was quite a cool way to share the students work and so he asked me to help run the page when we had just started and then from there we started looking around on facebook and agricultural sites and we discovered that there's actually hundreds of thousands of farmers from across the world on facebook using facebook Mm. groups to connect with each other and share information but also share a lot of misinformation so Mm. that's sort of how we got into using social media and we've spent the last two years sort of understanding how these groups work and how the farmers are currently using them and then identifying how we can use these platforms to connect these farmers directly with researchers, specialists, and then agricultural science students. Mm. Um, And it's progressed quite a lot. The project or the, the project that we give the second year students has evolved and become more focused on sharing videos where they grow a crop and explain the different components of growing the crop. Um, And then at the end of last year, we tested running an online learning program through Facebook. uh, That particular program focused on the basics of weed management. And it was a Mm. huge success. And so that's actually what I'll be focusing on for my PhD going forward. But the, the next step for us right now is to now get all the undergraduate students' assignments and the practical reports that they submit and the practicals that they do to be incorporated into these learning programs. So we can create learning programs on all the different subjects that are offered at the University of Britain um, and then hopefully give the students some real-world impact with their work. We've seen with our little project that the Year after year, the students are submitting higher quality work and getting more excited about the project because they see what they're submitting can actually have a positive effect in society. Mm. So we hope getting all of the undergraduate work online and part of these learning programs, we can increase the quality of education that we're delivering within our department and then also increase knowledge transfer from the university itself out into the community. Oh man, that's that's really exciting, um, and you know, there's always, like you said, increasing the quality of knowledge. I mean, um, I always say that you know, once you once you've gone through your research, you'd always want to have 
um, because you spend so much time and effort, like two years for a master's or three years for a PhD. So it's always good to know that after you've done your research, it actually has got that real life positive um, impact, you know. So, um, you know, um, I just wanted to, to, to then bring it back to say that, you know, people... Um, in in general have got a little bit of a disinterest because I think that's also, it kind of links to that. People have a bit, little bit, normal everyday people have got a disinterest in this type of information, especially about agriculture. So um, like you said, which, which, and they, but then there's, there's a whole lot of misinformation going on about GMOs or whatever. Um, in, in your opinion, what has caused that disconnect of that misinformation, if I can say that? So firstly, I don't think people are disinterested necessarily in knowing where their food comes from. In fact, I think it's quite the opposite. I think they're very interested in their food because it's such a personal experience and has such strong cultural ties. But generally, they have an ill-informed opinion of how the agricultural system functions and a very romanticized view of what sustainable agriculture should look like, what they think it should look like. And I think this is because of a number of things. Uh, so firstly, we have the lowest proportion of society actually involved in food production than in all of human history. Um, and with increased mechanization and technological developments, this number is only going to get smaller going forward into the future. So on one hand, this is fantastic because more people are free to become lawyers and accountants, engineers, teachers, doctors, and whatever else they aspire to be. Mm. But it also means that fewer and fewer people actually know someone, personally know someone who works in agriculture. Yeah. The history of industrial agriculture is also quite murky. If we look at the last century, as scientists, we weren't very good at science communication. I mean... Mm. The whole latter half of the 20th century was pretty much categorized by a loss of trust in both scientific and political establishments. And Mm -hmm. then with the rise of the internet, we just had this flood of information and misinformation and the rise of clickbait culture. And so this has really overwhelmed the general public with conflicting messages. Mm. Um, I think there's also legitimate concerns about the economic model under which industrial agriculture operates. And often those concerns... And what do you mean by that? So, I personally am not a capitalist. I'm very much an orthodox Marxist. And so, there there is concern about the monopolization of the agro-business, the the large agro-businesses. There's also... Industrial agriculture does have its faults, as do all industries. I think people are just more aware of or more concerned about the, particularly the environmental impacts of the of the agricultural industry because of the sheer scale of the industry. I mean, something like 70% of the land surface area that we utilize is used for agriculture. So it's a massive operation. And so mm-hmm. there is obviously this need to produce cheap food to feed the masses but at the same time producing cheap food has a high environmental cost and so it's those playoffs that do need to be scrutinized and i think that's what people are concerned about and um, but we've mm-hmm. seen those concerns about looking at the economic model under which this operates being used to attack the science at the heart of it and i think that's really shown in how gmo crops became synonymous with monsanto um, and it's oh, yeah. ridiculous oh, yeah. that the amount of hate that a company received and that the amount of hate this technology received, but there are legitimate mm. concerns for patenting genes, although those aren't necessarily just linked to GMOs. Yeah, um, um, just, thing- um, I just want to clarify that for the people who don't know what Monsanto, Monsanto is, because not everybody is familiar with the agriculture of it. Um, it's a seed company here. So it was an agrochemical company initially, or chemical company initially, that then branched into uh, seed breeding um, as they moved into ag- after they moved into agrochemicals. Uh, okay. But they became infamous because they produced the first herbicide-resistant crops, and so mm-hmm. people saw them as selling trying to sell more herbicide because now they're selling these herbicide resistant crops, but 
but there are definitely benefits to herbicide resistant crops. My own grandfather was, a, as I said, a, a seed breeder. So this, yeah. the concept of owning seeds and patents on seeds um, has been around long before genetic modification technology existed. Mm. It just came under scrutiny with the particularly herbicide resistance and insecticide resistant cultivars. All right. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to backtrack a little bit because um, I had you explaining something. But you mentioned that, um, you know, they list, they, I, we said that they, people are not, not interested um, in their food. There's just, they, they just, they just list people who are involved in the process of agriculture, you know. So um, you spoke about overall your whole, the whole concept of your research currently, right? Um, it is also trying to get your small scale and emerging farmers to to connect with these social media platforms that some of the students are are in, in the university are using. So obviously, for this to work, it will require a lot of buy-in um, from the farmers, especially the the small scale farmers. And they live in these remote areas. Um, and some of them have got poor network connections and limited access to data. So then how do we make this exercise of bringing, bringing all of this information, the research, et cetera, more accessible to them so that they are not left behind, if I can say that? So I choose to work with small scale farmers specifically because I think there's enough research for the, the industrial farmers and there's enough support for them from the private corporations. Small scale mm. farmers are not supported as well as they should be in South Africa and through most of the world. Um, and so our research has shown that these farmers are incredibly hungry to get access to information that is relative or relevant to them. Um, yeah, definitely. We've yeah. seen a lot of positive response from our, our interactions online, particularly with the learning programs. The feedback we receive indicates that there's a massive need for these programs and that the farmers, these smallholder farmers, really want to upskill themselves and learn more about the theory of agriculture, the theory of agricultural science. Mm. Um, we've been focusing on Facebook for a number of reasons, but one of the major reasons is because it's the largest social media platform. And so most of the farms are already on Facebook and using it anyway. The cost of data for these guys is one of our major concerns, uh, but this is also why we're focusing on social media. So firstly, the cost of the technologies needed to access the internet is falling dramatically, and social media apps are designed in such a way that even the most basic phones can access them if they can get access to the internet. Social mm -hmm. media corporations are also, and specifically Facebook here, are investing billions into researching how to make their platforms more accessible to the entire world. This is because their mm -hmm. business model is such that the more people they have logged on and scrolling through the timeline, the more advertising space they can sell. So oh, okay. Oh, okay. there is that incentive for them to get the entire world basically connected on social media. Data is a concern for us, but there are a number of data-like versions of these social media apps. So like Facebook Lite, I think it was the third most popular Android app in 2017, if I remember mm -hmm. the stats correctly. Mm -hmm. So these data-like versions are very popular and are widely used. In South Africa, the major cell phone networks also have specials on certain days where specific social media platforms are free to use as just part of their, their marketing campaign. But we also expect a decrease in the cost of data in the next few years. Um, in mm -hmm. South Africa, government has now mandated that cellular network companies must decrease their data costs. But then also the global pandemic that we currently find ourselves in has reignited a discussion around universal basic internet and internet mm. as a basic human right because it's such mm. a critical component of society. So the research does show that in the next few years, we do expect the majority of people to be connected through the internet. And in Africa, largely through cell phones because yeah. Yeah. we have such an extensive landmass that we have to connect. Okay. Well, Richard, um, that sounds that well sounds and good, good, but then how do you measure the success of this research? Um, are there other people who've done, are you the first ones who are currently doing it or are there other people in other countries who've run successful um 
you know, successful implementa- implementation of what you guys are currently doing where you can learn from them? Or, yeah, how do you then be like, okay, what we're doing is actually working? What what quantitative model, if I can say, um, are you using that you're like, okay, what we're doing is actually working? How do you measure that success? So we've been using the data that we receive as social media account managers. Um, There's Mm -hmm. a staggering amount of data that you can access. Um, You can use it to understand post popularity, follower demographics, and a whole lot of other useful information. The next stage is to see if these social media learning programs have some real world impact. And so to do this, we're going to be working with smallholder farmers to document any changes in practices and then quantifying any sustainability increases before and after they participate in one of our learning programs. So that's going to include us going out into the field, measuring Mm. and quantifying Mm. water usage, fertilizer usage, and a whole lot of other metrics. Um, There is a lot of research... So, so oh, there is sorry. a lot of research looking at science communication through social media. But mm-hmm. as far as we know, we are the only group looking at social media as a tool for agricultural extension. Okay. No, that's good. What I wanted to say was that I was going to ask you if you are actually going to go into the field or is this just going to be um, uh, just run through the social media. So at least you've you've mentioned that. So that's it's my biggest thing is it's all very well as creating these online things, but I want to see some real world impact and to be mm. out in the field measuring and quantifying these things. So I'm very excited yeah. that we can finally get into the field in the next season and, and start measuring these, these sorts of things and demonstrate that there hopefully is some real world impact from what we've been doing. Yeah, definitely. I'm I'm sure that's that'll be the part where you'd be like, aha, the eureka moment. Like, okay, people are actually learning something. And I think the pra- they so it's all well and good to have the theory, but you know, the the practical aspects of it is when you see that something has really been taken up and taken up well. No, exactly. Yeah. So um, you know, I know you said that this whole concept came from your supervisor. Uh, second year module that he was teaching but you know in South Africa agriculture is not a a first choice for many students in fact you know I don't even think many people understand the career opportunities available in this field so then um, from your view how do we rebrand and make because I'm also in agriculture you know how do we rebrand and make our field more fashionable to students that they can be eager to take it up and you know at at the undergraduate level so even in the module that my supervisor presents and that i help him with the majority of students aren't plant-based agriculture science students so Mm. part of this project was to try and get students who weren't interested in agriculture more excited about plant production Um, I think we really have to change the mindset that agriculture isn't a serious science or a viable career path. Uh, Agriculture is an incredibly complex batch of sciences, um, and we're looking at an enormous number of variables as well as the sociology aspect. Um, And I think here, social media is probably going to be our greatest tool. Uh, And Mm. I I really do think we need more agriculturalists, the scientists, the farmers, the extension specialists – on social media, showing the world what it's really like in the industry and the opportunities there are. Um, I'm currently working on two other side projects, which are focusing on attracting more young scientists into the agricultural sciences, which should be up and running in the next six months. But it's, I really, at the end of the day, I think it's taking up space online and sharing the stories from within the industry and building some public trust, I guess, that Mm. we are doing good and we are trying to build a sustainable food system and showing them that it's, it is a lot more complex than what most people think. And there is a lot of research that goes into producing the food that so many people take for granted. Yeah. That they just see on the table or you go to your produce market and you just get it, but there's just so much behind all of that. You know, so I think you're right. It's, it's, um, it's good that you guys are doing this. Um, you mentioned that you're working on something. Do we get a little teaser or is it still 
and under wraps and you can't talk about it yet? Uh, so the one project I can talk quite a bit about, so it's called hashtag talking ag. It was mm-hmm. initially start, we started it last year to try and expose undergraduate science students who are still a bit confused about what avenue they want to take to mm-hmm. the agricultural sciences and to industry and to show them there are incredibly diverse job opportunities out there and there's a massive need for more agricultural science students um, and the plan is to increase our our reach and start looking at going into high schools and talking with with scholars who are perhaps unsure of what their next step is after school show them the possibilities the second one is more of a community engagement project uh, that we've we're just putting the wheels into motion, which is looking at how we can increase um, community gardening and home-based gardening to increase food security at a a community level. And so we want to get our department expertise within our department and start um, offering uh, question and answer sessions and providing more learning material specifically focused on home-based and community gardening and then once the COVID-19 restrictions start relaxing hopefully get out into communities and provide some practical support uh, for schools and any sort of institution that could benefit from having some form of food garden on their premises. Oh man, that's fantastic. Um, And Richard, we can tell that you're really passionate about the field that you're in and um, You've accomplished a lot, and I'm sure um, you have a lot more aspirations. Apart from that, what are your future aspirations after you complete your PA, um, your your masters, uh, you know, and you know PhD? Because I know you mentioned that you you're going to continue on with that. But what else is there for you? Um, so I really do just want to continue working in research and working on solutions specifically to help smallholder farmers and to build a more sustainable and equitable agri-food system. I'm very passionate about social justice, and so it's a big component of how I approach my research. Um, mm-hmm. And then also really enjoy working in the university environment because I enjoy lecturing and working with undergraduate students. But anything when I can have my my feet on the ground in communities providing science-based solutions uh, would be great i haven't really thought too much past the phd but uh, (laughs) yeah no but i'm sure it'll it'll come it'll come (laughs) it'll come and just lastly as we close this off like you know what advice would you give to an inspiring you know african who wants to get into the field of STEM, specifically in agriculture. I know we touched um, about it earlier. Um, You know, what advice would you give them that you've learned so far? So I think throughout this podcast, a lot of the answers have been very optimistic and I'm very passionate about my work and I love it. And probably my my greatest, uh, greatest benefit from my work is that every day I wake up and I'm excited to go to work and to work with passionate people and to try and make a difference. But science is very difficult. Um, yeah. It's, it's yeah. really, it's a, it's a tough field to work in. It's uh, science degrees are very difficult. I think all degrees are difficult, but science in particular can be quite lonely. It takes a lot of mm. self-discipline to put in those hours, um, not just for the theory, but also the practical skills. Um, I did a weed science trial last year where I weighed and identified something like 20,000 individual weeds and I nearly lost my mind doing it. (laughs) Um, I've also had a lot of problems out in the field that were just completely beyond my control. Um, So it can be quite disheartening, but our work can have such a positive impact uh, in society. And as I said, we're desperately short of agricultural science students in all the different sectors. Uh, Mm. So I think... If there's anyone out there who's interested in science, not just biology, but the chemistry and physics as well, and you like solving complex problems, uh, there's definitely a career for you in the agricultural industry. Uh, And Mm. I think if people are worried about job security, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us anything. It's that one of the few industries that cannot stop is agriculture. People need to eat three times a day and we need more scientists and specialists. 
but the need is yeah, there. We yeah. just need people who are excited to work long hours and to, <laughs> to embrace difficult, complex research. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. We do need people. And like you said, um, yo, those 20,000 weeds, what? That's insane. <laughs> it was, it was <laughs> <laughs> it was insane but I, I, like you said um, it's it's not easy but I think like once you have a passion for it like how you have a passion you get up and you continue and you keep on going and there's so many people who need to come into agriculture or in science as a whole there's just so many things available in this field and it's been great chatting with you and um learning more about what you're doing and your passions and all the things that you're involved in with the community and with your, um, with the, with your passion in social justice. And, um, I thank you for taking the time to chat with me and I wish you nothing but the best with everything. And as you finish up your masters, yeah, all the best with that. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's been great. And to everybody else, thank you for listening to another episode of the Roots of the Science podcast with your girl. Until next time, bye. <laughs>